for preparing our hearts as we encounter here the Word of God this morning. The message this morning deals with restoration. Once upon a time, there were two brothers who shared adjoining farms. And for over 40 years, these two brothers had the opportunity to help each other out with equipment or jobs that were needing to be done. But one day, there was a rift that developed. And of course, it started with a small misunderstanding and it grew into a major difference. And finally, it exploded into an exchange of bitter words followed by months of angry silence. Well, one day, the eldest brother, Pete, was out in his field when a truck pulled up and out jumped a man who approached him carrying a carpenter's toolbox. He said, I'm looking for a few days work and perhaps you would have a few small jobs for me to do. Well, yes, said Peter. He said, see that creek down there? It's the border between my brother's farm and mine. My brother keeps it nice and deep to keep me from setting one foot on his beloved farm. Well, I'll oblige him. I want you to take that timber over there by the barn and build me a new fence, a real tall one, so I don't even have to look over at my brother and his farm anymore. The carpenter said, I'd be glad to have the work, and that'd be wonderful. He said, "Uh, just point me to your post hole digger, and I'll get started. Well, the carpenter set about working, and in the meanwhile, Farmer Pete had to go into town to a cattle auction, and when he came back, it was about sunset, and he was really shocked to see what the carpenter had done. There was no fence, no fence. Instead, the carpenter had built a bridge. And walking across this bridge when Pete got there was his younger brother. He held out his hand and he spoke to his brother, Pete. He said, Pete, after all, you've, uh, all I've done to you these past few months, he says, I can't believe that you would reach out to me. You're right, he said, it's time to bury the hatchet. Two brothers met at the middle of the bridge and embraced, and they turned to see the carpenter hoist his toolbox on his shoulder and walk away. And Pete turned to him and said, no, wait, he said, stay a few days. I've got a lot of other jobs for you to do. And Pete said, I, or the uh, carpenter said, I'd love to stay on Pete, but you see, I have many more bridges to build. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your many blessings to us through the word of God. And we pray, Lord, this morning that the message from 2 Corinthians would speak to hearts. May it truly be a blessing to us as we understand your heartbeat and your desire. And may we follow through and be obedient as Paul has challenged the Corinthian church to be. I pray this all in Christ's precious name. Amen. See, one of the problems that we have in the real world is sin. We would understand that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have a problem with sin. And the Bible points out that at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ will, being the bridegroom, receive to himself the bride, and we will be received uh, blameless and holy in all things. But until that time, we find ourselves dealing with sin. And uh, as I asked in the last uh, hour, is there anyone in the auditorium that is without sin? And uh, there were a few hands, but they're very holy people. You see, the problem is that we all have sin, and sin has encroached upon the world, as you know, going all the way back to Adam and Eve. We find ourselves struggling with sin. In fact, all of us sin on a regular basis. Even those who are disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus Christ, still struggle with sin. The Apostle Paul is going to talk about restoring someone who had sinned. In fact, he's going to address the church at Corinth because there was a very difficult scenario that had developed there. And uh, when this person was dealt with, there was a desired outcome. And God has, throughout the word of God, expressed to us what our actions should be to restore brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ, uh, at the appropriate times uh, when there needs to be repentance. In fact, one of the famous passages of Scripture is Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew 18, it, it says in verse 15, if your brother sins, he says, do this. Go and show him his fault in private. And if he listens to you, you've won your brother. Well, the desired outcome is to win your brother. 
There are always going to be situations where there is sin, as I've mentioned. But there are certain relationships where it is appropriate that you go to a brother who has sinned against you and you seek to have that desired restoration. Sometimes, even in the church of Jesus Christ, it's necessary to carry out church discipline because we know that we're not perfect yet. We all do sin. As I understand the scripture, it's very important for me as a follower of Jesus Christ when I sin to go to God as soon as possible and ask for forgiveness. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful, that is God is faithful, uh, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what our God seeks to do. And the relationship with our God comes back together. When a relationship is out of sorts within the body of Christ, it is similarly necessary to have confession and there needs to be forgiveness so that there can be restoration. Matthew 18, Jesus' teaching there is very clear and it's developed more fully as we go through the epistles, especially the Pauline epistles. So you and I this morning find it necessary to really understand the process, I believe, of restoring a sinning brother. Take your Bibles and go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In the beginning of this chapter, in verses 1 through 4, in fact, the Apostle Paul is talking about some of the difficulties that he encountered with the Corinthian church. Uh, as you know, I pointed out this last week, there was a letter that was written by Paul which took place and substituted for his visit, physical visit to Corinth. Now, he'd already been there for three years prior to this, but there is sin there and there is a very painful time as he is visiting Corinth. And he leaves there and because this problem is not remedied, rather than go back and experience another painful visit, he instead decides to send what has become known as the severe letter. In chapter 2 here, he says, I determined this for my own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow again. So you begin to get the impression here that this is very important, but that Paul does not want to subject himself once again uh, to a painful relationship. He says in verse 4, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you. That's a severe letter. He said, I wrote it with many tears. Not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. When Paul goes back to Corinth, he wants to have a, be on the basis of a good relationship where the church is doing the right thing and things are able to be commended and there can be blessings as opposed to going and enduring a very painful visit once again. And this is the backdrop to what Paul is going to talk about. Verse 5, we come to our text this morning. In verse 5, Paul says, but if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some small degree, in order not to say too much to all of you. We find here in this passage that there are necessary reactions uh, to ungodliness. And what we find here in this passage is that the godly reaction to ungodliness is demonstrated by Paul, who has been harmed, and the church in Corinth, which has also been harmed. You see, this person, according to verse 5 here, has grieved Paul, no doubt personally. Uh, we don't know exactly what the sin is. We don't know what the scenario was. The Bible doesn't give us that information. Uh, but this individual may have even led a revolt against Paul. Remember, Paul's severe letter really deals with much immorality that is there in Corinth. There was a, a huge, huge problem. And uh, the people that were coming to faith in Christ didn't understand and didn't even know what true godliness looked like. And there was much immorality in society and what was in society was filtering into the church as well. Some theologians say, well, this is the 1 Corinthians chapter 5 person. You may recall in 1 Corinthians 5, and Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. He is saying to the Corinthian church, listen, uh, there's a problem. There's an incestual relationship among people, members of your church. 
And so he urges them to take action, and they take action at that point. Some people think that this is that person, and he's repented. However, we don't have uh, absolute proof of that. And given the level of sin that was there in the Corinthian church, I'm sure that this process of church discipline was ongoing and fairly active during this time period. So we don't really know who it was or what they were doing. Suffice it to say, though, that this person brought difficulty and pain to the Apostle Paul. It was not an easy situation. And Paul had referenced some of the standards that God's word indicated needed to be followed. And he was very explicit in this. And he was giving this word out so that the church would follow through. And so Paul has a reaction. And his reaction towards this, shall I call him a person of interest, uh, was such that he wants him to repent. And so he has given this order to the church. Well, the Corinthian church, and this is the second part, it is the Corinthian reaction to this person of interest. Notice what Paul says here uh, as we look in verse 6. Paul writes, he says, Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was afflicted by the majority. This was action that was taken by the church of Corinth. They had taken the appropriate action to deal with this individual who had caused not only Paul great pain, but also the church at Corinth great pain. We don't know exactly what the action was, but whatever that punishment was, it was intended to bring about repentance. And that is exactly what has taken place. And so Paul is commending the Corinthian church for doing the right thing. They've done the right thing by taking the stand and punishing this one who has caused so much pain and so much difficulty. Now, I think it's, it, it's to be commended uh, because so often in churches, uh, this is not followed. In fact, in most churches today in the United States, there's no church discipline that ever takes place regardless of how many times it's in the scriptures. I remember as a young man, I was in my 30s. I always think about that, you know, you're in your 30s, and I'm thinking, I have kids now this old, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, you were dealing with this, and, and I'm thinking of my daughter dealing with a problem. We, we went to a church to be the pastor, and I was there just for a short time, and you know how you're always trying to memorize everybody's names, and uh, you're trying to figure out, okay, you know, and, and so it's confusing enough, isn't it? I mean, especially when you have like four people named Bob and 10 people named Sue, and you're trying to figure out all of these things, and I'm trying to figure out who belongs to who, you know, couples-wise, and couples, may, you know, you make it a little easier, you know, you put the two together, and it's like, okay, they're so-and-so. Well, I was trying to put this all together, and I kept asking questions about this couple over here and this couple over here. Well, it turned out that they had similar names, but you see, this man over here saw this woman over here and decided to leave his wife and live with her. Now, the irony was that that man over there saw that guy's wife, and he decided that he would live with her. I remember one of the deacons, deacons meeting, I said, Pastor, I never knew our church had problems. <laughs> so, so let me get this straight, you know. So they're married, that is, they're married, but... And they were committing adultery, both couples, living with each other's respective spouses, coming to the same church on Sunday morning, but at least sitting on different sides of the church. And everything was fine. So we took a, a deacon and I went with a deacon over to the one gentleman's house and I explained to him that this was sin and that it really couldn't continue. And I called him to repent of his sin. He said, if I leave now, he says, where am I going to go? I can't go back home. My wife is living with this other man. And I said, well, I've got a sofa in my house that no one sleeps on, so you can come to my house and you can sleep there. I wanted him to leave that relationship right there and then based upon that repentance and get out of there. He refused to do so. Both couples were brought before the church. And, uh, of course, they didn't show up for the meeting, but the church voted uh, to put all four of these members out of the church body. And, you know, to me, it was so crystal clear what we had to do 
in that situation. But I still remember this woman coming up to me afterwards. Pastor Kevin, I don't think it was the right thing for us to do this. What gives us the right to be able to do that? And I thought to myself, are you kidding me? But I didn't say that. I didn't say it. I just said, the Bible gives us the right. And it's not so much the Bible gives us the right. The Bible tells us this is what we need to do. It's not like we're trying to go out there and exercise a right that, that we somehow have entitlement to. That would be the last thing. None of us would do that. We do it because it's, this is what God's word says. And because God is concerned with the holiness of his people. Do we understand that? God is concerned with the testimony of his church. And so we can't live however we want to live and, and abide in all types of wickedness or in sin. And so to the credit of the church here in Corinth, they had carried out what was necessary and they had done the right thing. You see, there's many churches, as I mentioned, that never would do that. Because even in the most clear cut of cases, you will have people within the church saying, I can't believe we did that. And so the Apostle Paul commends them for doing exactly what needed to be done. There was a godly reaction to ungodliness. But there's also, in this context here in 2 Corinthians, a godly reaction to repentance. I want you to see this here in this passage. For the Apostle Paul uh, speaks about his own forgiveness. Paul would say this in verse 14. So we're going to skip down to verse 14 and then come back up. But he says, but one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I've forgiven, I've forgiven anything, I did it for your sake. So the Apostle Paul is noting that he is willing to grant forgiveness. Paul calls on the church here uh, as well to do the same thing, but he is willing to initiate a Christ-like response in bringing forgiveness to this individual. Now, this individual had no doubt caused Paul all kinds of pain. It's not an easy scenario. Things that are said are very, very significant, aren't they? We live in the day of technology. Isn't technology great? There's so many things that people say. We become a society of wusses. I mean, we, we won't even go up and talk to somebody face to face because if we can email them or text them or do something, Instagram them, is that right? Or, or Twitter them or something. I mean, you know, it's like we just throw these things out there. We expect, the, you know, the, the, the punch to come. But if I asked how many here have received an email that was, was pointed, disgusting, nasty, cruel, demeaning, et cetera, et cetera, most people have. And we receive this from people oftentimes who are supposed to be loved ones. We create these problems, we create these barriers, we create this pain. And it is an epidemic in our country. We don't have the, the, the insight or the discernment to be careful and, and take care of how we speak to each other. I want you to know that Paul had tremendous pain because this individual at the church of Corinth had evidently done something horrible that has caused not only Paul pain, but it also caused the church pain. And Paul says, verse 14, but still I forgive him. I forgive him. Now what you have to read in between the lines here, and Paul is not as explicit, but the Corinthian church knew it, and Paul knew it, was that this person had repented. They'd repented. Oftentimes you'll hear, I, I don't know say often, but occasionally you'll hear of someone who has uh, maybe lost a loved one to a drunk driving accident, and you might hear that person say, you know, I forgive the drunk driver, um, you know, I'm forgiving that person. But you've got to understand that that's a good thing to do. It means they're not harboring bitterness and so forth. But the relationship that we're talking about here is a known relationship, and the ultimate goal of this relationship is for forgiveness to be granted because we're looking at something far bigger. Remember, every single person who's ever been disciplined in a church setting has always been disciplined for the same reason. Did you know that? The same reason. 
and it's a lack of repentance. They were confronted with sin, they refused to repent, and because of that, action is taken. This individual, the punishment must have been sufficient. We don't know what the punishment was. Excommunication, banishment, uh, a rebuke, I'm not sure what it was, but whatever, it had the desired effect, and this person is now repentant. And so Paul can say, yes, I'm forgiving this person, and this is the repercussion here. Now Paul, as well as you and I, when someone desires to be forgiven, we must forgive. Do you understand that? We do not have the right to sit back and hold back forgiveness. Uh, we know that in Luke chapter uh, 17, in verses 1 through 4, Paul, God's is teaching us and Jesus is teaching to his disciples. He says it's inevitable that stumbling blocks are going to come, but woe to the one who they come through. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. By the way, that's not good. A millstone is enormous. And he says then he would uh, cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, important, if he sins, do what? Rebuke him. Rebuke him. Remember, the writer of Hebrews would say, a son disciplines his or a father disciplines his son because he loves him. So your brother sins, you rebuke him because you love him. And if he repents, he says, you forgive him. And if anyone sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times to ask for forgiveness, saying, I repent, he says, forgive him. So you're forgiving him on a ongoing basis and that's all important you see there are many who are broken and the ultimate desire here is for Paul to encourage the church now who has also been pained by this individual to respond wisely notice with me verse 6 so we went to for verse 14 now we're backing up to verse 6 and it says there sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him, otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed. And so Paul's encouragement is to forgive, comfort, and then drop down to verse eight, wherefore I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. And so the sufficiency of the punishment had worked, and Paul is saying, listen, not only should you now forgive such a one, but comfort him. That word comfort from last week, we learned that it means to encourage. So you need to encourage this one who's maybe been formally banished. He says, bring him along and say things that will encourage him. Let him know that he's not the only one who sins and not the only one who lacks repentance at times in our life. Encourage him because Jesus Christ is, is the difference maker and he forgives us all when he's when we sin, amen? And we, we understand what restoration is because of our walk with Jesus Christ. And he says, so then go to that one and reaffirm your love. Reaffirm your love. You need to take actionable steps here in order to allow that person to know that they are fully embraced by the body of Christ. Why is this so important? Because people are oftentimes broken by sin. But when they want to come back to Christ, we need to offer them the opportunity for that restoration. Let's remember that there is always one singular objective for disciplining God's church, and that is restoration. Restoration is what we seek. We want to be able to see this person restored to the fellowship of the body of Christ. And so here's this man. He has sinned, he's repentant, and now we find him, quite frankly, seeking to be in fellowship with the Lord. Paul is going to give a warning to the church at Corinth. There's two things here that we need to see because Paul is going to, to again, uh, list here a, a major component uh, for the church at Corinth to consider. Notice there in verse 7, he says, you need to forgive and love this one or forgive and comfort this one and you need to do it. Otherwise, this one who has been put out may be overwhelmed by sorrow. They may be so sorrowful 
because the church body will not extend fellowship to that one again. You may be in a personal relationship where, where someone is repentant and seeking restoration, and you won't grant that restoration. And the reason why you won't grant that restoration is because they haven't suffered enough yet. You see, the Corinthian church had suffered at the hands of this individual. And they're looking at it, no doubt, sitting there thinking to themselves, yeah, I'm glad he's repentant. Good. But don't think he's coming back here. Don't think, don't think we're going to you know, treat him like we did before. We want him to suffer. We want that person to suffer. They said some nasty things, and now they say they're repentant. You and I can't judge their heart, but eventually it'll come out if they truly are repentant, right? Paul says you need to love this one. Don't allow him to be overcome by sorrow so that they might jettison the church and even walk away from their faith. He says, you and I need to be careful in how we handle others. And it doesn't stop there. Paul's warning continues on. He says, as you go to verse, uh, later on here, verse 14, as I already read that, but noticing following that as well, um, I'm sorry, verse 10 rather. Uh, it's tough when I don't put my glasses on. I apologize. He says in verse 11, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. We're not ignorant, he says. And so this is the second point. There could be a person who is just so discouraged that they walk away from it all. The second warning is you need to be careful because Satan is always trying something and we need to be careful. And Paul reminds the Corinthian church, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. We know what he's up to. Uh, the NIV translates this, uh, Satan would outwit the church. Um, literally, the word means uh, to take advantage of. And it was used in a context quite frequently during this time period when Paul was writing, speaking of someone who would cheat someone else or rob from someone else. Uh, so Satan is always at work, and he's always trying to cause problems. He's trying to cause problems in your personal relationships. He's trying to cause divisions within the body of Christ. Now, there's a couple of ways this could go. You could have Paul, who has forgiven this one and seeks to restore this one, divided from the Corinthian church, who are saying, no, we don't think he's done enough to be restored yet. So there could be division there. There's division there between the man who is overwhelmed with sorrow and the church at Corinth as well. There's all of these different things. Satan is very, very keen on disruption. He is going to disrupt whenever he can. Romans chapter 16, a great passage of scripture that warns about Satan, warns about how Satan causes divisions in the church. And Paul is warning there and he says, be careful, you know, identify those who would cause divisions in the local church and mark such a one so that Satan does not succeed in being able to part the water, so to speak, within the body of Christ. These are essential truths, are they not? We should know and understand that Satan is very, very mindful of various strategies and schemes to debilitate the church. We see Satan's work in the world today all over the place. You know, oftentimes we recount how God's at work and God is doing great things, and he is. It's exciting to see God at work. But we also are mindful of the fact that Satan's at work. Uh, we live in a country where Oh, just take this, this past week and, and the horrific shooting in, in Las Vegas, right? I have heard so many people blamed for that shooting. It's amazing. Um, I heard that he was this man who was the gunman, was a terrorist. Uh, and then somebody said, no, you know, he probably wasn't a terrorist. Maybe he was uh, mentally deranged. And they said his, his father was a criminal. And I read that the guns were to blame, and then I read that the bump stocks were to blame, and I even read a college professor said Donald Trump's to blame. I mean, it, it, it's amazing, but we're looking to try to blame wherever we can blame. And I have been saying for quite some time, as our country walks back away from God, and the testimony of the church, and folks, listen, the testimony of the church, it needs to improve. The, the church today is, is weak, it's sick. 
because of, of sin that has encroached in the church, because of uh, a Laodicean spirit of lukewarmness that's pervading our churches. I mean, we, we can't even get people to worship the Lord regularly on Sundays. And we find that by virtue of the testimony of Jesus Christ and the emphasis, the, the lack of salt and light in our world, Satan has inroads in our country, the United States of America, that he didn't have before. These are the kind of things you used to read about in third world countries where demonic uh, possession uh, would cause people to do things that were outlandish and, and cruel and horrible. I've never heard anybody say, well, maybe this madman, we don't think he was crazy, we don't think he was this, we don't think he was that, and authorities try to figure it out, I want to just submit, and I don't know, and maybe I'm wrong, but the truth of the matter is, Satan and demons and possession and can cause people to do crazy things. And as the testimony of Jesus Christ is diminishing, because true faith in Christ, authentic discipleship is diminishing in our country, we should be aware that Satan is able to accomplish much more than he did before. Imagine if this young, this man who shot all of those people had heard the gospel as a young child and put his faith in Jesus Christ, how this tragedy could be averted. You see, the complexities of the gospel and how they penetrate a society is great. Satan is at work. He's at work, he's attacking families, he's attacking churches, he wants to do everything he can. And Paul calls it to the memory of the Corinthians, and he says, listen, you need to forget all of this in the past that's been done. You, you need to encourage this person. You need to love him. You need to show forth true Christ-likeness towards this one and allow him to be restored, because if you don't, Satan will try to weasel his way in and cause divisions among the brethren, and so greater yet will be the destruction. We need to understand the importance of restoration and understand the significance of of when it is withheld. Brother to brother within the body of Christ. So important. Maybe you're here this morning and you've not yet sought restoration with your God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, you and I need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ because it's that relationship with Jesus Christ that allows our sins to be forgiven so that we can have a relationship with our holy God, amen? Jesus Christ has died on the cross so that we can have eternal life. We place our faith in the Son of God and we can know that our sins are forgiven. There's a story about uh, John Orderberg, a teacher at uh, Willow Creek Community Church in Illinois, and he tells a story about selling his Volkswagen Beetle so that he and his wife could go buy a sofa. And uh, his wife went to the store and they saw a beautiful mauve colored sofa. And they decided this would be wonderful. And the salesman said, listen, you're crazy to buy this. You've got little kids. And uh, if you do that, um, you know, the stains are not going to come out. He says, if you, you want a sofa, he says, you should get one that's the color of dirt. <laughs> Orderberg's wife looked at him and said, we know how to handle our children. Give us them off sofa. So from that day on, everyone knew the number one rule in the house was don't sit on the mauve sofa. <laughs> don't touch it. Don't play around the mauve sofa. Don't eat on, breathe on, look at, or even think about the mauve sofa. It was like the forbidden tree in the Garden of Eden, right? On every other ch chair in the house thou may freely sit, but upon this sofa, the mauve sofa, you may not sit, for in the day that you sit there upon, you will surely die. Then came the fall. One day there appeared on the mob sofa a stain. It was a red stain. It was a red jelly stain. So John's wife, who adored the sofa, lined up the three kids in front of it. Laura is four years old, Mallory's two and a half, and Johnny's six months old. <laughs> Gotta watch out for Johnny. See that, children, she said, that's a stain. It's a red stain. It's a red jelly stain. And the man at the store said, it will never, ever come out. Not forever. She says, do you know how long forever is? That's how long we're going to stand here until one of you tells me who put the stain on the mob's sofa. 
Well, Mallory was the first one to speak. She was the middle one, two and a half, with trembling lips and tears in her eyes. She looked at her mother and she said, Laura did it. <laughs> Laura passionately denied it. She passionately denied it. And then there was silence for the longest time. No one said a word. Now, John Orderberg was there, and he knew that no one was going to say a word. I mean, he, he, he just knew it. They'd never seen their mother quite so upset. He also knew they wouldn't say anything because they knew that if they did, they would spend eternity in the timeout chair. And he knew they wouldn't say anything because he was the one who put the red jelly stain on the sofa, and he wasn't about to say a word. <laughs> now, the truth of the matter is, we all have a stain. For all of sin come short of the glory of God. We know that that's the case. And it is only through forgiveness that we can have that stain removed and have restoration. And the restoration is so important. If you're here this morning, you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ. There's not been that restoration to take place spiritually. Then I encourage you today, as we bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord, to make a determination that you're willing to ask God to forgive you of your sin. And know that Jesus Christ, who is God, who died on the cross for our sins, is willing to forgive you. Would you bow your heads with me, please? As we have the opportunity this morning, you may be here and you may be dealing with one aspect or another of this process of forgiveness. Maybe there's someone who has wronged you, you've been sinned against, and you've been reluctant to offer that person comfort or encouragement. Maybe you feel in your heart that you have not suffered enough. Now, I want to say that I'm so glad that when I sin, I go to God and I ask for forgiveness, and he doesn't do that. He forgives me immediately, and my relationship with him is restored. That's the same thing that should happen with you as well. But maybe you're here, and, and, and maybe you need to ask for forgiveness. Maybe you've wronged someone else. Maybe there's a point in this relationship that you need to come to the point where you reaffirm your love for an individual. Whatever it might be this morning, if you're here today, you say, Pastor Kevin, God's speaking to my heart about something. Uh, please include me in your prayer as you close. I'd love to do that. Just slip up your hand. Be happy to do that. Amen. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Kevin, I'm not sure that I've had that stain removed. But today I want to call on Jesus' name for salvation. I want him to forgive me of my sin. I want to know for sure that I'm on my way to heaven. Just slip up your hand as well, would you? If I can pray for you today, thank you. Our care and concern workers will be up here at the front. We've got some wonderful folks up front. If you've got questions, you want to pray with someone, they'd be more than willing to take the time at the end of our service to do that. Our Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for your willingness to allow us to be restored to you. It's no wonder, Lord, that Jesus said that we're supposed to forgive others an unlimited number of times. For you forgive us an unlimited number of times. You restore to yourself wayward sinners every single day. And we thank you. Be with these who have asked for prayer. Going through situations, give them wisdom, give them a desire to do right. And be with those who have asked for prayer even with regard to putting their faith in Jesus Christ. May it be today the day when they call upon the name of the Lord in the quietness of their own heart as they pray, even perhaps right now, and ask Jesus to save them from their sin. Bless us, Lord, as we seek to do things that will honor you with our lives. I pray this all in Christ's precious name. Amen.